Oh, I forgot to put here the camera. There we go. All right, so basically we're gonna look at what is known as who can elasticity. Okay, and maybe you remember the Hooke's law for beams is sigma equal to E epsilon, no? But again, uh, remember that the Hooke's law that you study in solids is basically just for 1D problem, okay? But you have 2D and 3D problems. So for example, uh, you have 2Ds will be plates, okay? 3D generally, you don't use, them, okay? You only use 1D beams elements or beam theory, or you use 2D, which is plate theory, okay? So this will give you really the equations for 1D and 2D, okay? Even for 3D, if you want to complicate it. All right, so, so who can elastic body follows Hooke's law, basically, obviously, which states that the stress tensor is linearly proportional to the strain. I mean, all this stuff complicated way in solid mechanics, all you did was this equation here. It's this figure right here. Okay, that's basically what it means. But you know that for them, the material could be, you know, plastic and then you could have hardening but this is the assumption that you work only in this area all right so generally you had in one dimension you had the equation was written on the this one okay but if we have to rewrite it using the initial notation we know this could be one two to one and it will be symmetric and now the e here if is isotropic is this but you can have the solids cannot have the same properties on the X, Y, and Z. Okay, so we call that one C, I, J. Let me make sure I use the same indexes that are on the notes I, J, K, L, and this will be epsilon K, L. All Okay, so over here is clear that epsilon ij is the stress tensor. Sigma ij will be the strain tensor, but that's C i j k l is the elastic Constants So basically uh, these ones if you do the If you don't make any assumptions This would be a any one different elements. Okay, let's say you assume that your solid has no symmetric properties at all, okay? You can end up with any one element. So that's why, you know, that later on in the classes, maybe you did isotropic, we only be one because properties will be the same. You might have materials that are anisotropic saying that they might have different properties on the Y and Z, no? Like composites, 
So the matrix, these matrices will be a little bit different. So this is what we're gonna kind of study, all right? So we know that if the matrix is symmetric, which we know, I mean, what is the implication? Because we did the division. What is the implication to say that the, the stress is symmetric? Remember we did the derivation? What was, what needs to be the case for this to be true? Correct, you're almost there. Is that we say that it will be no momentum, correct? Which imply that we define the motion into two parts. One was translation, the one was rotation. So basically, we say that if there is no moment, we just assume that the motion of the body will be deformed by translation and it will be no rotation, okay? So that's really the assumption that this is symmetric. The assumption that it's symmetric is because you assume no rotation, okay? The moment was it, all right. All right, so J-I-L-L-K, okay? So if we have this, the number, if it's symmetric, the number of constant is reduced to 36. So to 36 elements, if you want to hear. So we start with 81, it is not symmetry. It is some type of symmetry, we go to 36. Okay. All right. Now I'm not going to do the proof of this. I might leave it as a homework, but the fact to have C I J K L equal to C J I L K implies that the Hulkan law, J, K, L, Epsilon, K, L, can be rewritten as Sigma I J equal to one half C I J K L plus C I J L K Epsilon K L. Basically, it's a way to rewrite since this will be symmetric, you just have to do one half plus one half, no? Okay. All right, or sometimes in the books, you're gonna find this, this is not too useful, but you're gonna find that they combine this over here. This is not useful at all, but they call this one like C prime I J K L. And then this would be Epsilon K L. I mean, I don't think we did that, but this is like uh, this is like matrix manipulation. If a matrix is symmetric, you can write it as one half of the matrix plus the other half of the transpose. Basically, that's what kind of means, no? When it's symmetric, because it's symmetric. When you do the transpose, you end up with the same one, no? Yep. Okay. And that has some properties when you do manipulation that is that simplifies the uh, the the calculus.
Okay, so for an isotropic material, <clears throat> CIJKL, you can rewrite it as being equal to lambda, delta IJ, delta KL plus mu delta IK delta JL plus delta IL delta JK. Here, what's important is that you remember that we kind of wrote, it was an identical but similar equation for a fluid, okay? And here we kind of use the same name for the variables, lambda and mu, okay? To make them kind of similar on the structure, okay? So that, I'm gonna go a bit faster, so that the equation, so epsilon ij equal to c i j k l epsilon k l becomes what? Becomes uh, sigma i j will be equal to lambda delta i j delta k l plus mu delta i k Delta JL plus Delta IL Delta JK. Epsilon KL. So now we're going to take the case that if L because of isotropic this will mean that L equal K, you have one axis of symmetry. Okay, in this one we have K equal I and L equal J. So that the equation is gonna become Sigma IJ will be equal to Lambda delta IJ delta KK plus then this becomes here L equal K. So this becomes here JL, correct? JL IK L equal K. So it becomes twice the same thing. Okay. So it becomes plus two times. mu epsilon ij because k equal i l equal j do you see what happened here okay right. so this is cook's law for isotropic materials. Which initially is the only one we're gonna start. Okay, we're gonna talk. So what happened here? Yeah, sorry for that, you're absolutely right. So what happened here is that this one, this one becomes L equal K. So we have IJ, this will be, and we can write this one just as uh, epsilon kk. So this one part here, epsilon kk. This become here epsilon. So basically this equation, let me just rewrite it quick, would be sigma ij, lambda delta ij, epsilon kk plus two mu, Epsilon IJ, okay?
Okay, so the important part of here is to recognize that as before, when we did in fluid, we said that lambda and mu were two variables that depended on the, that described the fluid. Okay, so in this case, these are two constants that are gonna define the material. Okay, so when lambda and mu are two constants, describing the material properties, okay? And the constants lambda mu are known, same as before, as the Lamez constants. Okay, so expanding this equation, if we expand that, that equation, expanding sigma ij equal to lambda delta ij epsilon kk plus two mu epsilon ij. We're gonna get six equation, which is what you generally expect will be when you write the matrices, we have three by three, no? Which is six terms, so it will be sigma one one. Will be equal to what? Lambda epsilon one one plus epsilon two two plus epsilon three three plus two mu epsilon one one. Okay. We do the same thing for two two. So this, the first term remains unchanged. Plus two mu epsilon to two. Epsilon three three equal to lambda sigma one one plus sigma two two plus sigma three plus two mu epsilon three three okay in this uh problem over here man because this is really this is really the equation for 2d okay what is the equation for 1d we say initially that the equation for 1d is epsilon equal to e so sigma equal to e epsilon Correct? This is what the one you study all the time for B. Now, what happened? The shame that you, that's a graduate class you could take actually, which is plates. In plates, what's gonna happen? When you deform in one direction, if you deform in that direction, this is gonna become thinner, no? What is the variable that takes that into consideration? It's the one that is called the Poisson ratio, okay? So if you look at this, what is the stress over here? You have the stress in one direction, plus then you will have another effect due to the change in, if you want in width or in, th uh, in width or in length, no? All right? So you need to have another term that's gonna take that into consideration. And you will see which one here is equivalent to the Poisson ratio, all right? So this will be like, if it was just one direction, this is the one taken in the second direction. And then we have here the sigma one, two, will give you two mu because i and j will be different so that term will be zero okay so we have two mu epsilon one two sigma two three will be two mu epsilon two three and sigma one three will be two mu epsilon one three
Okay, now I'm gonna have a proof here. I'm gonna do it. That way I don't get the homework. All right, page 111. Okay, so if we start from this equation here, sigma ij equal to lambda delta ij epsilon kk plus two mu epsilon ij. What we're, what we're gonna do here is we write epsilon fj, okay? So solving for epsilon ij, what do we have? Epsilon ij will be equal to one over two mu. We move all this stuff to the side of sigma ij minus the lambda delta ij epsilon kk. Okay, so in this equation here, what we're gonna do is see what is epsilon kk, okay? So if we do sigma kk here, will be equal to what? Will be equal to, this will be what? One plus one plus one, a little bit faster, will be uh, lambda times three, if you want, epsilon, kk plus two mu epsilon kk. Okay, so now I can factor out by the epsilon kk. So this will mean that sigma kk will be equal to three lambda plus two mu epsilon kk, or this will mean that epsilon kk is equal to sigma kk divided by three lambda plus two mu. And we can take this equation here And we put it over here, okay? So that we're gonna have epsilon ij will be equal to one over two mu sigma ij plus Lambda divided of three lambda plus two mu delta ij sigma kk. Oh, sorry for that. <laughs> Okay, so basically, what is the only difference? That in here, we write the stresses in function of the strains, correct? But now we rewrite the strains in function of the stresses. Yeah, okay. Because generally, what do you know in the problems? The stress is what you need to find, and what you know is the deformation, correct? That you obtain from the stresses. So you wanna obtain what is the deformation, from the stresses, okay? Or of here, you can get the stresses from the deformation. So you wanna have both options. So this is the first part, but this is not the end.
We can write it here. It can be shown, and I might give you that as a homework. That you can rewrite this equation here as epsilon ij equal to lambda plus mu divided by mu three lambda plus two mu of one plus lambda to lambda plus mu sigma ij minus lambda of two lambda plus mu delta ij sigma kk. Uh, here I forgot a parenthesis, I think, no? Here. Okay, so now we get what I wanted to go. So defining, now you will, all this stuff will make more sense. Defining E, we should be what? The Young's modulus, no? The modulus of elasticity is proportional to what? Is equal to mu of three lambda plus two mu divided by lambda plus mu, which is known as the Young's modulus of modulus of elasticity. And how do you obtain, Johnny, the that modulus of elasticity? That modulus of elasticity is the slope of this curve, okay? So I don't know if you remember the Matthias class, maybe you do the ASTM, American Standard Testing Machine, ASTM machine. You put a specimen, you apply certain force, you see how much it stretches, how much the cross-section changes, and you can evaluate what would be the E, no? Because it's linear, right? But you see that mathematically speaking, that E here is equivalent to those two materials over here, okay? So the E, you find it experimentally, and then you can find these constants, okay? So we have this, and then the other one we wanted to define is what? Is the Poisson ratio, and the Poisson ratio is equivalent to lambda twice lambda plus mu. And this is the one that is known as the Poisson ratio, which definition is what? What is the Poisson ratio defines? Defines when you elongate something, how much is going to stretch, okay? So you want is the, uh, how can I write this down? Would be the lateral or transversal, maybe strains towards the axial. So, if you want lateral to axial or length to basically, is that if you stretch something one, how much is going to become thinner? But you see, again, it's also in function of these two variables. So, what you can do experimentally, you can determine E and mu. Okay. Then you have. Two equations well, for how many unknowns? Two unknowns. That would be your lambda and your mu. But it might not be easy to solve because one has square and so on and so on. No? So that would be the way to find these variables would be by solving the equation of two system of unknowns with two variables. Okay? All right. So if you substitute this into this equation, okay?
So substituting. E uh, mu into epsilon j, which is this equation here. That's why you have to rewrite it under this form. Okay. We get that sigma epsilon i j will be equal to one over e. one plus mu sigma ij minus Poisson ratio delta ij epsilon kk. Sorry, I'm gonna write here. All right, so, so anyway, what I wanted to show is that this equation here is the equation for the strain for a plate when you simplify it for a 2D, okay? So now we're gonna define two other variables. So by suitable combinations, of the constants E and epsilon two additional constants of importance are defined. Okay, so one of them, maybe you might remember the notation, G is E divided by two, one plus mu. This is what you did actually in solid mechanics. If you knew the modulus of elasticity, you could estimate G, which is the shear modulus of elasticity. Okay, that's from where it comes. And this was equal to mu in the equation, which is the shear modulus. So in solid mechanics, what, what, what was the equation involving the shear modulus? We had the shear was equal to G times the lambda, which was the, uh, it's not the angle of twist, but was the angle when it was deforming. You had something like this when it was deforming like this, no? That was the shear strength, okay? When the change of the angle, all right? And then the other one, which really, is not covering solid mechanics, but you will understand what it is. Is K, which is E divided by three, one minus two times the Poisson ratio. And this one is known as the bulk modulus, all right? Okay, so here there is a page that I'm gonna to try to give you right now. I'm gonna show it, Johnny. I write it down, but I think it's a waste of time. So I'll just show it to you. There is a bunch of different combinations of the variables for the different relations. So depending on the books you use, you can find one or the other notation, no? 
So basically, I just did this one, lambda mu, I give you the E, which is this relation. The mu is this relation, the K will be this relation, okay? If then you can write in function of lambda and E, you can write mu, we have all these expressions. So depending on whatever you want, you can write some of these constants in function of the other ones, all right? So we're not gonna do all that stuff. Okay, I think I'm, uh, I will try to scan this one. If I forget, let me know. I will scan it and I will give it, and I will post it on the notes, okay? But you see over here, depending on the books, the notation, you might find all these different variables here. Okay, so if you use all these different notations, okay, you use one or the other, you can find another form of this Hooke's law, okay? So, using the new constants, the Hookean law could be written as what? So sigma kk will be equal to three times k epsilon kk. So this will be equivalent to sigma equal to e epsilon. Okay. Will be three kk or you could write it as uh, sigma ij will be equal to two g epsilon ij. So basically it means that depending on which variables you use, you can rewrite the Hooke's law into different forms, okay? That's all that is meaning. Uh, hold on one second here, put some primes. Okay, see so this is put here prime and here prime. So this one's where this is just some notation sigma prime ij, epsilon prime ij. This is the stress deviator. So it will be the strain deviator. And actually these ones are equal to what? Sigma prime ij is equal to sigma ij minus one third of sigma kk delta ij and Epsilon prime ij equal to the same thing, epsilon ij minus one third, epsilon kk delta ij. Do you remember we wrote the stress as the devi devi deviatoric stress tensor? We broke it into two components, and the other one was the uh, hydrostatic pressure. So this will be the hydrostatic pressure. This time, this will be the deviatoric. So remember, we had minus. Delta P, when we did the derivation, this would be the equivalent. Okay, all this stuff is the theory. At the end, I hope to give, reduce all these equations to simple cases, okay? But for now, they are general. Okay, so one more thing, and I think I'm gonna stop deriving stuff. One thirteen effect of temperature.
Okay, so in previous sections or in previous notes, the constitutive equation, so basically meaning the constitutive equations, meaning the sigma equal to CIJKL for the fluid and the CIJKL for the, for the solid materials were determined or were given, were determined at a constant temperature. Okay, but you agree, for example, that the viscosity that would be the property for the fluid will depend on the temperature. You increase the temperature, it becomes a lot more liquid, no? That's why it's good to warm up the car, no? Yeah, okay. Or if you heat a material, it becomes softer. It's the same reason, no? So we have a lower or higher, actually higher E, no? Young's model. So those two constants that we defined before, we also depend on the temperature, okay? So in that case, for example, we could say that mu, the one we just said would depend on temperature, which was the viscosity for the fluid. And we could say that the Young's modulus, we also depend on the uh, temperature. So modulus of elasticity. Okay, or in more general notation, because here I did the specific, maybe I should start leaving some space in between the lines. I'm gonna do that now. So for the fluids, we use the notation K, I, J, P, K. This one would be in function of the temperature. Okay. And C, I, J, I think it's K, L, yeah, K, L. C, I, J, K, L. We also be in function of the temperature. So the strain, I'm going to keep this simple. I'm not going to make it complicated. The strain due to thermal expansion is given by, I don't know if you remember or not this, but epsilon ij equal to lambda, I mean, really is lambda, delta ij is to make it uh, two, two dimensions or two dimensions, t minus t naught. This, has, this was the equation in solid mechanics that you say the strain was equal to lambda, proportional to lambda delta t, okay, in solid mechanics where in this case, where lambda, oh, yeah, but, uh, Okay, lambda is the coefficient of thermal expansion. Okay. So so that if uh, 
D stress due to the deformation. And the stress due to change of temperature. are combined by using the principle of superposition Okay, you will have that the stress will be equal. Remember, before we had what? The C I J K L times the epsilon I J. Now what's gonna happen? You're gonna have one term, which is the epsilon I J from before. Okay. But now you're gonna have the effect of the temperature. Okay. And this one will be minus lambda delta ij of uh, right delta t Okay, so basically what does that mean? I'm not gonna rewrite it, but all the equations we wrote before, you can use them for this one as well, okay? Because what is the important part over here is the principle of superposition, okay? Which means basically what? What is the assumption you're doing? Is that one is completely independent of the other one. So you can actually just add it, no? Okay, but that's a big assumption, no? Because you are you agree that, and that's the problem is that what happened, for example, if you start, if, I mean, this is true if you do static, okay? Static, it will be true. But what happened, for example, if you start doing, uh, to study the dynamic deformation, and it is, let's say it's only, at the beginning, there's not even temperature. But what happened to the structure when it keeps moving up and down? You generate heat, no? Just by the motion. And that heat is not just added. So this is just heat, like for example, if somebody was warming it up, no? But the other one by the motion is the one due to the motion. So really, this equation will not be valid for that, no? Correct? Because this term over here will also generate heat, no? So we need to be careful to know what we do. All right, when we do those equations. Okay. All right, so I jump a few things on the class notes. I'm going to look at the material. Symmetries. And anisotropy. Okay, so basically to see what happened to the C, I, J, K, L for different cases. Okay, so let's first start by giving some definition. What is anisotropy? So basically what is uh, isotropic would be the same problem. This would be the opposite, no? Okay. So an isotropy, but in a more general sense, refers to 
to the directional dependence of material properties. So basically it means that the material properties might not be the same on the X, Y, or Z direction, the one, two direction. Okay, and this would be important. An isotropy is important in what? So what is the type of material that would be an isotropic? If you study aerospace, all the composites, okay, are anisotropic. Okay. Okay, and there's different types of anisotropy. So I know this don't make sense, but let's write it down. So the different types, I don't know why I keep going in green, but it doesn't matter. The different types of anisotropy are determined by the existence of symmetries in the internal structure of the material. So basically, what does that mean? The more symmetries, the simpler the notation is going to be, no? Okay, so let's put it this. The more symmetries, the simpler C I J K L becomes no. Okay, to try to read that. All right, now we go back to something we study a while ago. So the symmetries. Can be related by orthogonal second order. Tensor. It doesn't matter which letter here I'm going to use Q, okay? Q. Uh, such that maybe you remember with this Q inverse equal to the Q transpose. And in that case, I think you had to do it on a homework. That was the one you needed to construct. Remember the figure? What would happen is that you have the QIJ, let's say for the different rotations, okay, or different transformation. What did, what did you have? If it's equal to plus one, it's a pure rotation. But the one we did was what? Was to minus one. you end up with a reflection, okay? All 
Okay, so the fourth or a tensor C I J K L can be rewritten in function or in terms it's better in terms of the second order tensor Q, which will have two components, okay? So there we go, C, I, J, K, L, is equivalent to Q IP, Q JQ, Q KR, Q LS, C P Q R S. Okay, how much time we have? Five minutes, so we have time, but now what we're gonna do is are looking at different different types of anisotropy, okay? And basically you're gonna see one, you're gonna end up with, I don't know how many times of C, and we do two or three and we stop all it, okay? I'm not planning to do more. But I mean, you see here, this is the way to write a fourth order tensor. I'm not gonna ask you to do it into a second order tensor, no? It can be quite complicated, no, for all these reasons. But anyway, let's stop over here. And next time we look at the uh, triclinic and the monoclinic and the orthotropic, and that will be it, okay?